Hello and welcome to Placing People First, a next phase podcast celebrating innovations in life sciences. I'm really pleased today to be joined by Stefan Likinov, founder and CEO of Salve Therapeutics. Uh, he trained at UMaine, at Pitt, Hopkins and Harvard. And today's discussion is going to explore the motivations and, and the positive mindset required in the creation of a startup. And we'll be hearing firsthand about some of the key considerations to have in mind from the outset in order to build something organically with integrity and with clear vision. So Stefan, thank you very much for joining me today. Yeah, thanks Steve, thanks for having me. Great to be here, really appreciate it. You're, you're very, very welcome. Um, so when we've spoken before, I love the analogy that you used about Tarantino movies and how this relates to building a business organically without going straight for securing private equity yep. investment. So can you tell us a little bit about how Tarantino movies relate to your business? Yeah, um, I mean, he started out as basically an indie filmmaker and you know he, he used a lot of sort of um, extreme techniques to get attention for his films. And with the revenue that he generated, he would reinvest it directly into better equipment for his next film. So better cameras, better uh, staging, better people. And so the next film, having better sort of elements, would also come out better and generate more revenue that he would then reinvest. And so it's it's kind of like classic capitalism, basically applied to art. Um, but it led him to become a really sort of renowned director really quickly. Um, and he didn't have to have the, the the great equipment off the start. He just used sort of like good ideas, interesting techniques, and sort of a, a brash personality that others weren't willing to to use. Um, but it made him, it, he was a really self-directed artist. And I think that um, that's what allowed him to become sort of the name that he is now. So for the startup, um, I, I had no intention of being like a great artist or being brash, but the, the idea of um, starting with maybe smaller, easier projects and generating revenue that could be reinvested in larger projects which is actually, I mean, it's it's not like a novel idea. That's how small business has been forever. Um, but now with like sort of the, the allure of private equity, it's hard to forget that that simple technique of, you know, revenue generation is still uh, very valid. Mm. It's a really interesting mindset to have. As you say, you're not necessarily reinventing the wheel, but your approach to it when I was doing a bit of research when we spoke before about Salve Therapeutics and what it is you're trying to achieve, I think the spirit behind it is is really inspiring. So I just wondered, oh, can, can you say a little bit about the uh, about Salve Therapeutics? How yeah. about the story behind it? So I think um, the the elemental ideas were um, popping up in about January 2020 when I think COVID was just around the corner. And um, so the, the webinars were, you know, ascending and you could basically, you know, attend any conference anywhere, which is pretty, pretty convenient. Um, and sure. I started, um, I just graduated from Harvard in 2019. Um, I wasn't doing much. And so during these webinars, I started learning a lot about um, sort of new areas that I hadn't considered before. And also kind of becoming more entrepreneurial just because um, I had worked in labs several times and was kind of uh, sick of it and felt that I could apply the knowledge better into, in a private setting. So um, the ideas that I guess kind of struck me the most were um, those around gene therapy um, first. So just because the idea of like a permanent cure for these inherited diseases that don't get much attention from big pharma um, is really appealing. It's, it's not cost effective, of course, you know, you, you get a net loss if you're curing patients. Um, but, but it's such a social imperative and, and with sort of medicine changing in more socialized directions in the U S right now, um, it, it seems sort of unjust to leave such patient populations behind for economic reasons. Um, and the other thing is just the, the, the nature of viruses is are really, it's really cool. You know, they're, they're not quite dead. They're not quite alive. They're like these little machines. Um, but if you think about it, every, every tissue has, an armamentarium of evolved viruses to it. So you already have vectors ready to target whatever disease tissue you want if you have a gene therapy to fix what's creating or causing the disease. Um, so that that was kind of staggering to me that, you know, the cures are there, kind of like natural products almost. Um, 
And the last idea was definitely sort of the the advent of um, you know AI computational techniques as applied to drug design. So using um, you know advanced technology to um, better design and iterate and um, sort of feel your way to to a rational drug faster than just you know haphazardly or by accident like you would for penicillin or AAV. Um, <clears throat> and so if you combine all those ideas together, what you actually have is more of like a bioengineering firm, really, that uses mm -hmm. technology to prototype um, complex viral drugs. Um, instead, you know, similar to how like a GE would prototype a prosthetic or, or Samsung would prototype um, something before they actually go into manufacturing and selling. So again, not a novel idea, but sort of a classical business engineering tactic applied to um, biomedicine and biotechnology, which I don't think is really the one, the one gulf I noticed was that <clears throat> most biologists don't like math and most mathematicians don't like biology. So that divergence in like the fields prevents really, I think, um, rational drug design from becoming what it could be, especially for biologics. So with that in mind, then what, what you're potentially bringing to the market is something that's going to, I, I guess, enable things to move forward a lot more quickly. Yeah. I think that's, that was actually a lot of resources. Exactly. Yeah. That was the pitch from the beginning. Um, the first pitch we did was in September, um, 2021 to an organization called startup springboard, which is actually run by a, a UK media group. Um, and we were pitching alongside like, you know, people from Harvard, MIT, I, I didn't think we were actually at that stage yet, you know, without a prototype. But um, yeah, the, the, the main points we were trying to make um, were that if you use like a software method, you can cover the viral space available more quickly. So you can you can like sift through um, what's available in government databases um, in terms of like viral files to find potential cures. Mm -hmm. And you can also then play with them, like uh, we use the, the motto of virtual Lego kit, um, to mix and match pieces together virtually, which is a lot faster and easier than um, in the laboratory, to, to sort of like match the virus available to whatever tissue happens to be diseased, virtually, of course. And then if you can like increase your confidence that way, you can, um, you know, just get to, to from hit to lead faster and with less expense and more safely. Okay. I mean, it's a fantastic vision. So w with that in mind, because there's, there's such complex technology behind this, how have you, I, I, I would assume it'd be good to understand more from, from, from your perspective, but I would assume that this is going to require a lot of collaboration with external yeah. parties um, to help to, to really sure. test ideas and bring an ex into excellent expertise. So how, how does that work from, from your position in creating this startup? Yeah, that was our strategy from the start. Um, because when I, my first idea was just to start like a viral AAV gene therapy company. Um, but then I realized if you had design software to start, you could go way beyond AAV. But I, I couldn't mm -hmm. code. This was like maybe March, 2020. Um, and no, I'd say March, 2021, probably. Yeah. I couldn't code, so I couldn't build the software I was thinking of, but I knew of like CAD style software from, you know, just the engineering field in general and, and my family having some engineers in it. So I, I sort of like reason that if you build a BioCAD software platform first and then um, build your drug portfolio around that well, at the same time, you know, licensing that software, if you want to um, collaborators, um, you can develop two revenue streams really quickly and also um, <clears throat> form a lot of partnerships and generate a lot, generate a lot of drugs for patients. So the idea of like um, partnerships with other organizations that could do what, what I couldn't or what we couldn't was, was from the very start. Um, so if another example is I, I knew I had the idea and couldn't build it, so I had to protect it to make sure nobody else took it. Even though we have like mm -hmm. a, a first first to like conceive law here in the US, not a first to file like in Europe. We're a bit more protected if we have the idea and can prove that we had the idea first. We don't actually have to file to, to prove that. Um, 
I, either way, I, I joined a program at Hopkins that gave me tech transfer support. And um, I just submitted the idea as a report of invention. And <clears throat> they gave me a copyright uh, protection because that's what you would actually, um, that's the IP that would apply to software in the US as a copyright because it's, it's actually written basically. Um, whereas they left the, the patent ownership and um, company equity all to me. So that was a pretty good deal actually. But once I had that copyright and sort of like, you know, the, the copyright JHU on my pitch decks, um, I was able to start sort of talking about the idea more easily to see if it was actually valid. Like, could you really apply AI to viral design? And, um, mm -hmm. I, you know, the, the sort of confidence of the IP support made me more convincing, I think, to tech and biotech people. Um, and now we're, we're not sort of like fully engaged, but we do have like official partnerships with NVIDIA, Microsoft. Um, we're looking to form one with Thermo Fisher because um, they're getting a lot into like automated smart lab technology. And if you have software that could sort of run that stuff, it, it'd be really mm -hmm. convenient for them. Um, and, and also just, I think, you know, as any entrepreneur would tell you, networking is really important because that's how you learn from people, make connections, make friends of course. and all that. Um, so yeah, that, that was the idea of like having others help us with their expertise was, was definitely foundational to where we are now. That's amazing. And to be able to get some very high level prestigious clients on board, like our partners on board like that is, is, is fantastic. It, it did get me thinking a lot about IP and I suppose having a really good IP strategy is going to be so important, especially if you're trying to enter into some kind of licensing deal where people could potentially take what you've done and 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 take it off in different directions yeah so i'd be really interested to understand over the last couple of years what what you've learned about having a really good ip strategy and what, what that looks like yeah um i think what taught me the most was um this this webinar series from the law firm morrison forrester hosted by the harvard biotech club okay. that i attended um well there are two webinar series there's one for startup law and ip law um, there was one through MIT too, that was pretty useful. And I think the main thing is just knowing, um, the different types of like IP options available to you in your invention, um, and, and being able to sort of, um, get them in place quickly to give you the, the confidence and security you need to, to work on your invention. Um, and, and honestly, it's, it's not a complete hundred percent guarantee. So like if you, for example, have an idea and file for a patent, they may reject it, you know, thinking that it's, it's just not worth it. So um, okay. it, it does take a little bit of thought to almost like not rig, but <laughs> conceive <laughs> and, and devise the IP in a way that it'll be accepted um, sure. by the USPTO. But the, the sort of strategy, which is also, again, not novel, is to, to build a good IP portfolio of sort of, you know, interlocking products, if you will. And that IP portfolio, which, you know, you have kind of a monopoly over for a few years, is what allows you to have sort of stable revenue streams to, to build your business upon. Mm -hmm. And it's not it's not exclusive to, um, uh, you know, venture capital or angel capital or private, that, that's totally fine. Like you can do that too, if you're willing to sacrifice a percentage of your company to move faster. Um, and, and that kind of, I mean, that depends on the product you're building. Like that's, that's usually more useful for software, but, um, mm -hmm. I, I guess like the IP strategy just gives you sort of like something on paper that'll exist, whether you have money or not, which is usually a big stressor for entrepreneurs. Um, and now, yes. now we actually, we have another piece of IP that's actually getting more attention than the viral project but it's also a simpler IP. So it'd be a better sort of like first stage revenue generator. Um, and then there's a third one that came out of a hackathon in LA um, that connects us directly to the NIH here in the US. So it, it really, it's it's been like, you know, going to workshops and hackathons and, and seeing what comes out of them in um, the COVID era that's that's led to us having an IP portfolio. And, and yeah. at first I thought it was just like, you know, kind of, the Southwest flying around nonsense, but um, not to insult Southwest. I think it's an interesting company, but 
it wasn't expected is what I'm trying to get across. I, I didn't think that was like a way that I'd be doing business at this stage of my life. Um, but it turns yeah. out that building that sort of inventor portfolio is, is it, it has historical precedent. So um, it seems to be working for us so far. Yeah, that sounds amazing. Cause I imagine that the cost of getting it wrong would be pretty significant. I'd imagine there'd be certainly a lot of ways yeah. in which you could give, give your IP away or give, give away things too easily. And what I like from, from what you've described so far is, you know, and taking that sort of that Tarantino spirit that you mentioned at the beginning of doing things organically, making friends along the way, having real integrity behind what it is you're doing and really sticking to that. Vision. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's also, I think, um, since this is a European pro podcast, I, I, it, we do have a lot more security here in the U S from, um, okay having like a first to conceive statute. So like if I have an idea and I can prove that I had the idea first, it's already legally protected without me having to file. Whereas a, a first to file oh, law, right. yeah, like okay. a first to file law, like you have in France or, or something like that, you know, somebody can have an idea, but if they misspeak to the wrong person and they file it, the, the original inventor gets locked out. Um, I didn't realize that. So, yeah, so, so actually, that, as long as you can prove. Yep almost retrospectively that you came up with the idea yeah. that you are more protected. So I think, I think we, we do have um, really tight intellectual property laws here that you, you can prove an idea is stolen from you and still get credit for it. Um, you have to pay the legal fees to prove it. Um, but it, but that also gives you more breathing room than, you know, having to be hundred percent quiet about something for fear of, okay. you know, not being able to get justice of your ideas f filed from under you. <laughs> Yeah, of course. But especially when you're creating a business that's based on such um, human principles, you know, being able yeah. to uh, help get get medicines to, um, you know, uh, I, I was reading um, when we spoke before about some of the some of the rare conditions which otherwise you know, kids may not necessarily get the the chance to receive treatment for certain conditions. Yeah, so for sure. There's such an altruistic kind of vision behind this. You know, it's it's, it's important that you're able to be, you know, to have that recognized that that's that that's that's yeah, that's what you're bringing. No, for sure, and especially because um, in in academia, you know, the, the IP law hasn't exactly, I mean, law in general hasn't exactly penetrated academia. <laughs> I think it's a little bit more murky yeah. than than say the private sector. Um, so if I had to worry about my idea getting poached, like an experiment being sabotaged or, or data getting fabricated um, around academics here in the U.S., like I, I, it would just paralyze me with fear. So knowing that there's like this this referee in terms of like the the civil government that I can prove that this was my idea first to, um, which academics sometimes don't like, is um, it's just, it's, it's, it's very kind of pro inventor. It's pro entrepreneur, you know? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Of course. So can, can you say a little bit more about then the, the, the vision behind Savvy Therapeutics? Because it's been a, it's been an absolute whirlwind over the last two, three years in, in, in getting things to where they are now. So where would you like to see it going over the next few years? And what, how yeah. would this get? Well, it's funny because the original name of the company was Salve Technologies, but I couldn't incorporate it as that because there's already a UK telehealth company called Salve Technologies. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. And, yeah. and it, the other irony is that we're actually getting into telehealth now with the second IP that we're working on, um, which is a digital healthcare app for warfarin patients. Um, so the vision, I'll, I'll admit, like, I, I've kind of been tinkering up until now to because I haven't. I haven't taken it seriously because I didn't think it was like really something that could work out. It's my first mm -hmm. company. Um, I, I like research, but I didn't really like being in the lab. And so um, I guess I'm just now being convinced that the company could actually work out and become something revenue generating and fundable with the IPs that we have and the attention they're getting. Mm. And so I actually had to kind of, figure out what my vision is, like where, where, where I'd like this company to go. And I've, I've had some, some good people along the way kind of help steer me. Um, I guess in terms of just like practical logistics, we definitely want to go to an IPO. We don't want to sell to somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, companies like Illumina, Amgen, um, you know, Biogen, others that have stayed independent sort of inspire us. 
Um, yeah, I, okay. I grew up in Framingham, Massachusetts, which is the home of Genzyme, which is now Sanofi Genzyme. And, you know, Genentech sure. belongs to Roche. And, and I guess, you know, that, that could be good for those companies, but I don't think we want to go that way. Just it, it sounds more our style to be an IPO, which is harder, but, you know, it also makes you kind of work more determinedly. And then in terms of um, patients, we're definitely about patient advocacy. So we, we just won an award through um, the Facilitate organization with a PH. It's a gene therapy organization in the UK, actually. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a patient advocacy award and we do not belong on the list with those other companes. So like we're, we are very like <laughs> no, nowhere near it them. Like you're doing yourself down. It sounds like you, you've uh, no, uh, well, uh, very uh, humble. Uh, well, no, <laughs> it's, it's just to, nice of them because we they must have recognized. Yeah. We didn't expect it, but, but th then when they, when they labeled us as such and, and I applied for it, I was like, you know, we kind of are because if we're trying to reduce um, gene therapy prices with technology for patients and if we're trying to make, um, with this other IP, the healthcare app, patient self-monitoring more, more easy and more, you know, mm -hmm. responsive from the clinician side, then we actually are about patients, you know? Um, yeah. And I, I guess for, for me, like, um, I have a mental health history, so I've been a patient. I can be in their shoes. I've been in their shoes. I, I know what it feels like to, to be like hopeless or have despair or, you know, think, think nobody's helping you or have nobody help you. So I think, I think what hurts the patient most is thinking that they can't do it themselves, not in terms of like self-medicating to, to like a dangerous degree, but you know, you, you are your counsel, you are your advocate and you, you have rights no matter how sick you get. So I think mm -hmm. that if there's companies and technology out there that helps the patient do it themselves, almost like a like a punk attitude to medicine <laughs> i think that um <laughs> um you'll have more healthy people you know and and sort of like the, the the healthcare burdens that we're all worried about will slowly dissipate that's really inspiring hearing that and yeah um, so i think i think to, to answer your question, i think we'd, we'd continue trying to build ips that are pro patient um yeah yeah yeah, I think um, it, the the organisations we're involved with who are somehow linked to rare diseases, there's there's a, a there's a, a deeply human reason why people do what they do. Yeah, sure. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's incredible hearing that. So, I mean, with that in mind, because I I, I I I get the strong sense that you're that you almost you've almost been a bit up until now surprised by your own success. Yeah, no, I, as yeah, a, as an organisation, absolutely. And, 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 then, and then that, that could be a really, really positive thing. And in fact, actually there was a, there was a chap I spoke to fairly recently who he's now is a chap called Martino Picardo. He's now the chairman of Discovery Park in Sandwich in Kent in, in the oh, UK. Cool. And, um, he's, so he's very well known, very well respected within the industry. And he was talking through his career and he was talking through how he got to where he is. And he said that if, if he went back to, to talk to his younger self, um, you know, he, he he would have had no idea that he would end up being chairman of Discovery Park. But yeah. he's just, he's made a series of decisions throughout his career that felt right at the time. It's all been grounded in having a real ethical approach. It's all been grounded in wanting to make treatments better for patients and improve access for, sure. um, it, for, 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 for people who otherwise may not have it. And, and then he said, also, there's been a, a good fortune along the way a lot of hard work mm -hmm. and all of those things, they just naturally take you forward. But I think having that really strong vision, which you've, you've said that you don't want to go down a certain route. You're very, very adamant that you want to, you want to do things your way and you want to hold tight to, to your IP. I think that, I think that's, that that's commendable. So with, with that in mind, I mean, what would you say are the biggest challenges that you've encountered so far over the last two, three years? Yeah. What advice would you maybe give to other people who are considering a similar kind of venture? Um, the, I think my main ambition was to avoid distraction while I was, you know, conceiving and building the company just to, to stay focused on it. Um, also because once I realized that this was like a legitimate way to live, I became really motivated to just keep, keep doing it, um, <laughs> yeah. a, a, as I was simultaneously surprised. So I, I've lived several different places in the past few years to kind of like minimize that distraction. Um, 
I, it's the, it started in Framingham, Massachusetts. Then I moved to Dorchester, a, a neighborhood south of Boston. Um, and then I lived in a cabin in Maine for a while. So the first YouTube video that I recorded about Beercad was at my grandmother's dacha in Maine, <laughs> you know, off the grid, <laughs> you know, powering my computer with my car. Um, and then I came back to Framingham to my grandmother's house and then moved to LA because um, an incubator lab launch out there whose CEO is actually from London um, reached out to us and we, we needed the corporate address for some government grants we were applying to. Um, but now I'm back in Framingham and, and the, the striking thing is I've lived all these different, all these different places, but every address for the company has remained the same, you know, legally and on paper. Mm. And I've done everything virtually. I've only met, I've had one, two, three, And then I've had about eight other people work with me and I've only met one of them in person at one point in Maine. Really? Yeah. And, mm. and the people who are working for me now all have full-time jobs. And again, I, you know, don't deserve them. They're, they're awesome people way, way better than I am as human beings. And um, I think just the, the power of the argument and the vision for, for Salve and the IP and sort of being able to deliver with those at the right time convince them to work with me, which is really um, kind of humbling. So the the challenge besides living was also sort of, um, you know, acquiring that personnel, which can help your company mm -hmm. look better to, um, you know, bigger organizations. And that took a lot of careful thought as far as like how to present and, you know, pitch the company while you're hiring these, these co-founders. Um, but it, it, we all have similar personalities, sort of like a, maybe a, I don't know, we're all a little bit nihilistic, maybe, <laughs> you know, we, we, <laughs> we want things to, we want things to work out and we work really hard, but we know sometimes they don't. Um, sure. but I think that, um, n now I consider them pretty good friends. So I, I, I think, um. I think we'll go pretty far together just because we're, we're sort of starting to act in concert as a, you know, in, in a much more efficient fashion. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think when you've got a team around you who you, know, you respect each other, you can understand each other's drivers and you've maybe got a similar worldview that that can really help. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think the other challenge was also, um, this is this kind of maybe, um, plain, but moving across country was, was pretty difficult. <laughs> it was, um, you know, a huge challenge, a fun drive though. The desert's awesome. Um, but, but, <laughs> but I, I didn't totally try to eliminate private equity. I, I was pitching to various incubators and accelerators as I was moving across country, okay. but it's really just because I, I couldn't write the grant that I'm writing right now while I was driving cross country. So, mm -hmm. um, I, um, we, we got pretty far. We got up to the Alchemist Accelerator and got a split decision, which is, you know, the sort of father of Y Combinator. And, um, you know, that, that, that was a feather in our cap without any sort of prototype. So um, <laughs> it, it kind of getting that attention, even though we didn't get any money, kind of confirmed that the idea was a sound one and that it should, it's mm. worth continuing. Um, and, and now we, we, we just got accepted to an incubator at Mass General Brigham, a big hospital system out here um, for the healthcare app. So that, that hopefully will be developed quickly to generate revenue for the larger vi virus project. Um, but, yeah, but the challenge, course. another challenge was like just not knowing where it's going and kind of having to, <laughs> to improvise and, and be piecemeal about it as you go. Like I, I realized pretty early on that the virus project was a huge one and I needed the smaller Tarantino IPs to, to build it. Um, so it's almost like a, a breach birth in a way for a company. It's like coming, coming out backwards. But, um, I think that, you know, it, it's, um, it's starting to work out and I'm, I'm still pretty, pretty impressed and thankful that it is. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, I think you've got a, a, a clear idea and you, you get a sense that okay, this is this is the one we want to continue to develop, this is the one we want to continue to nurture. Yeah, for and sure. You just you always have that working in the background, but then to, to have some other things that you're you're developing at the same time, it also potentially reduces that risk or helps you to 
to have future revenue streams as well. Well, I, I mean, I certainly wish you ongoing success in continuing to, to spread the name of Savoy Therapeutics. And, um, and so we, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's an industry where there's so much, um, it, it's so much about collaboration and, and making friends along the way. And it sounds like you've got a very good start doing that. Yeah, for sure. No, thank, thanks, Steve. I appreciate that. And I mean, I, I think the first country that we'll incorporate in besides the US is the UK, for sure, just because mm. um, we've gotten so much attention from, you know, great scientists and, and industry people out there that um, I think I think the, the market's really compatible with what we want to do. So um, this is hugely helpful for us. Thank you very much. Um, we're talking to the economist next week, so it comes at a good time. <laughs> and we'll, oh wow, we'll, yeah. talk to the economist. We'll see where it okay. goes. Yeah, <laughs> maybe slightly higher profile than well, they're, they're having a cell and gene therapy <laughs> conference in Brussels, I think. So we just I, on a lark, I, I sent them an email, and we're talking next week. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> well, that's fantastic, isn't it? But that, it, it starts to snowball then because you start to get a little bit of traction yeah. from something like that. Yeah, and people uh, and so much of it, uh, and it's. You know, I'm outside of work. I'm a I'm a musician, and um, the um, kind of that spirit of you you have to just keep putting things out there in whatever way if you want to, and, and it would work the same if you're a, a an artist or yeah whatever you you do out. So it's, it's so much about generating a bit of of interest and and people starting to see you more and more and associating right. you in the right kind of ways. Um, and definitely, definitely so, like leveraging networks yeah. against each other. So like, you know, if yeah. once you get a partnership with like XYZ company, tell others that you have that and it'll attract them to you for sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There's a, um, I don't know if, if, if this would be the same, a lot of other conferences, but they, the advanced therapies Congress, which is one we we've attended to, um, a few times and we're, we're going to in, in March of this year. Mm -hmm. Um, it's quite a quite a big uh, conference in, in in London. They have a really um, interesting gathering of of startups and just that that um, opportunity for people to do a sort of a short pitch of their yeah. of their their vision, their company, but to do it with a very receptive and very relevant audience. That 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 type of thing, I guess, is is a is a great way to get continue to get the name out there and, and associate yourself with companies, especially people in a different territory who don't necessarily know you just yet. Yeah, no, absolutely. It, it's, it's really cool to, to have that international kind of interaction and, um, you know, kind of all come together around the same problems and missions and, and solutions. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Stefan, thank you so much for joining yeah, me today. Thank you, it's Steve. been fascinating. A lot hearing of fun, about, for sure. Yeah. You, yeah. Yeah. You're very welcome. It's, it's, it's really, really interesting hearing how you got this up and running in the first place and, and, and why. Because it's the sort of thing I guess a lot of people have those ideas, but don't actually press the button and and, and do it, and actually, um, you know, move away from that more traditional. Right, I'm going to get a I'm going to get a job, and I'm going to work up. The yeah, career. it helps to have no what mortgage, no say, kids, you know? no pets, <laughs> and and a lot of options. So <laughs> <Exactly>. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think it's absolutely commendable, especially with such amazing technology behind what it is that you're doing. So cool, thank wish you. you ongoing success. Yeah. But, uh, and yeah, thank you very much for your time. Yeah, I'd love to come back at some point. Thanks, Steve. <laughs>